Boys Will Be Boys by Irwin S. Cobb from the Saturday Evening Post. When Judge Priest on this particular morning came puffing into his chambers at the courthouse, looking with his broad beam and in his costume of flappy, loose white ducks, a good deal like an old-fashioned full rigger with all sails set, his black shadow, Jeff Point Dexter, had already finished the job of putting the quarters to rights for the day. The cedar water bucket had been properly replenished. The jagged flange of a 15-cent chunk of ice protruded above the rim of the bucket, and alongside, on the appointed nail, hung the god dipper that the master always used. The floor had been swept, except, of course, in the corners and underneath things. There were evidences, in streaky scrawls of fine grit particles upon various flat surfaces, that a dusting brush had been more or less sparingly employed. A spray of trumpet flowers, plucked from the vine that grew outside the window, had been draped over the framed steel engraving of Preston Davis and his cabinet upon the wall. And on the top of the big square desk in the middle of the room, where a small section of cleared green blotter space formed an oasis in a dry and arid desert of cluttered law journals and dusty documents, the morning's mail rested in a little heap. Having placed his old cotton umbrella in a corner, having removed his coat and hung it upon a peg behind the hall door, and having seen to it that a palm leaf fan was an arm's reach should he require it, the judge in his billowy white shirt sat down at his desk and gave his attention to his letters. There was an invitation from the Highland B. Crazy Camp of Confederate Veterans of Edinburgh asking him to deliver the chief oration at the annual reunion to be held at Mineral Springs on the twelfth day of the following month. An official notice from the clerk of the Court of Appeals concerning the affirmation of a judgment that had been handed down by Judge Priest at the preceding term of his own court. A bill for five pounds of a special brand of smoking tobacco. A notice of a lodge meeting. Altogether, quite a sizable batch of mail. At the bottom of the pile, he came upon a long envelope addressed to him by his title, instead of by his name, and bearing on its upper right-hand corner several foreign-looking stamps. They were British stamps he saw on closer examination. To the best of his recollection, it had been a good long time since Judge Priest had had a communication by post from overseas. He adjusted his steel-bowed spectacles, ripped the wrapper with care, and shook out the contents. They appeared to be several enclosures. In fact, there were several, a sheaf of printed forms, a document with seals attached, and a letter that covered two sheets of paper with typewritten lines. To the letter, the recipient gave consideration first. Before he reached the end of the opening paragraph, he uttered a profound grunt of surprise. His reading of the rest was frequently punctuated by small exclamations, his face meantime puckering up in interested lines. At the conclusion, when he came to the signature, he indulged himself in a soft, low whistle. He read the letter all through again, and after that, he examined the forms and the document which had accompanied it. Chuckling under his breath, he wriggled himself free from the snug embrace of his chair arms and waddled out of his own office and down the long, bare, empty hall to the office of Sheriff Kyle's birdsong. With him, that competent functionary deputy sheriff, Breck Qualls, sat at ease in his shirt sleeves, engaged with the smaller blade of his pocket knife in performing upon his fingernails an operation that combined the fine deftness of the manicure with the less delicate art of the farrier. At the sight of the judge in the open doorway, he hastily withdrew from the tabletop where they rested, a pair of long, thin legs and rose. Morning, Breck, said Judge Praise to the other's salutation. No, thank you, son. I won't come in. But I've got a little job for you. I wish to... If you ain't too busy that you'd step down the street and see if you can find Peep O'Day for me and fetch him back here with you? It won't take you long, will it? No, sir, not very. Mr. Qualls reached for his head and snuggled his shoulder holster back inside his unbuttoned waistcoat. He'll most likely be down round Gafford's stable. What's old Peep doing, Judge? Getting himself in contempt of court or something? He grinned, asking the question with the air of one making a little joke. No, what saved the Judge? He ain't done nothing. But he's about to have something of a highly unusual nature done to him. You'll just tell him I'm wishful to see him right away. That'll be sufficient, I reckon. Without making further explanation, Judge Priest returned to his chambers and for the third time read the letter from foreign parts. Court was not in session, and the hour was early and the weather was hot. Nobody interrupted him. Perhaps fifteen minutes passed. Mr. Qualls spoke his head in at the door. I found him, sir, the deputy stated. He's outside, here in the hall. 
Much obliged to you, son, said Judge Priest. Sandy Monin, will you please? The head was withdrawn. Its owner lingered out of sight of his owner, but within earshot. It was hard to figure the presiding judge of the First Judicial District of the State of Kentucky as having business with P. Poday, and though Mr. Coles was no eavesdropper, still he felt a pardonable curiosity in whatsoever might transpire. As he feigned an absorbed interest in a tax notice, which was pasted on a blackboard just outside the office door, there entered the presence of the judge, a man who seemingly was but a few years younger than the judge himself, a man who looked to be somewhere between 65 and 70. There's a look that you may have seen in the eyes of ownerless but well-intentioned dogs. Dogs that expecting kicks as a daily portion are humbly grateful for kind words and stray bones. Dogs that are fairly yearning to be adopted by somebody, by anybody, being prepared to give to such a benefactor a most faithful dog-like devotion in return. This look, which is fairly common among masterless and homeless dogs, is rare among humans. Still, once in a while you do find it there too. The man who now timidly shuffled himself across the threshold of Judge Priest's office had such a look out of his eyes. He had a long, simple face, partly enclosed in grey whiskers. Four dollars would have been a sufficient price to pay for the garments he stood in, including the wrecked hat he held in his hands and the broken, misshaped shoes on his feet. A purchaser who gave more than four dollars for the whole in its present state of decrepitude would have been but a poor hand at bargaining. The man who wore this outfit coughed in an embarrassed fashion and halted, fumbling his ruinous hat in his hand. How do you do? said Judge Priest heartily. Come in. The other diffidently advanced himself a yard or two. Uh, excuse me, sir, he said apologetically. But this here Breck calls. He comes after me and he said as how you wanted to see me. It was him as bring me here, sir. Faintly underlying the drawl of the speaker was just a suspicion, a mere trace, as you might say, of a labial softness that belongs solely and exclusively to the children, and in a diminishing degree to the grandchildren of native-born sons and daughters of a certain small green isle in the sea. It was not so much a suggestion of a brogue as it was a suggestion of the ghost of a brogue, a brogue almost extinguished, almost obliterated, and yet persisting through the generations south of Ireland, struggling beneath south of Mason and Dixon's line. Yes, said the judge. That's right. I do want to see you. The tone was one that he may employ in addressing a bashful child. Sit down there and make yourself at home. The newcomer obeyed to the extent of perching himself on the extreme forward edge of a chair. His feet shuffled uneasily where they were drawn up against the cross rung of the chair. The judge reared well back, studying his visitor over the tops of his glasses with a rather quizzical look. In one hand, he balanced a large envelope which had come to him that morning. Seems to me I heard somewhere years back that your regular Christian name was Paul. Is that right? he asked. Surely is, sir, assented the ragged man, surprised and plainly grateful that one holding a supremely high position in the community should vouchsafe to remember a fact related to so inconsequent an atom as himself. But I ain't heard it for so long I come mighty nigh forgetting it sometimes myself. You see, Judge Priest, when I was nothing but just a shaver, folks started in to call me Peep, on account of my last name being Ode, I reckon. They've been calling me so ever since. First off, it was Little Peep, and then just plain Peep, and now it's got to be Old Peep. But my real entitled name is Paul, just like you said, Judge. Paul Felix Ode. Aha. Uh -huh. And wasn't your father's name Philip, and your mother's name Catherine Dwyer Ode? To the best of my recollection, that's partly so too, sir. They both of them up and died when I was a baby, long before I could remember anything at all. But they always told me my pa's name was Phil or Philip. Wally, my ma's name wasn't Kath. Kath wasn't what you just called it, Judge. It was plain Kate. Kate or Catherine. It makes no great difference, explained Judge Priest. I reckon the record is straight this far. And now... Think hard and see if you can ever remember hearing an uncle named Daniel O'Day, your father's brother. The answer was a shake of the tousled head. I don't know nothing about my people. I only just know they came over from some place with a funny name in the old country before I was born. The onlyest skin I ever had over here was that they no count trifling nephew of mine, Pess Dwyer, him that is to hang round this town. I reckon you call him to mind, Judge? The old judge nodded before continuing. All the same. I reckon there is no manner of doubt, but what you had an uncle of the name of Daniel. All the evidences would seem to point that way. According to the proofs, this year Uncle Daniel of yours lived in a little town called Kilmerin Island. 
He glanced at one of the papers that lay on his desktop, then added in a casual tone, Tell me, Peep, what are you doing now for a living? The object of this examination grinned a faint grin of extenuation. Well, sir, I am knocking about, doing the best I can. Which I ain't much. I help out Ron Gafford's livery stable. And Pete Gafford, he lets me sleep in a little room behind the feed room. And his wife, she gives me my whittles. Once in a while, I get a chance to do odd jobs for folks around town, cutting weeds and splitting stove woods and packing in coal and such as that. Not much money in it, is there? No, sir, not much. Folks is more prone to offer me old clothes than they are to pay me in cash. Still, I manage to get along. I don't live very fancy, but then I don't starve, and that's more than some can say. Peep, what was the most money you ever had in your life at one time? Peep scratched with a freckled hand at a stash of faded whitish hair to stimulate recollection. I reckon not more than six bits at any one time, sir. Seems like I've sort of got the knack of living without money. Well, Peep, such being the case, what would you say if I was to tell you that you are a rich man? The answer came slowly. I reckon, sir, if it didn't sound disrespectful, I'd say you was pranking with me, making fun of me, sir. Judge Priest bent forward in his chair. I'm not pranking with you. It's my pleasant duty to inform you that at this moment you are the rightful owner of 8,000 pounds. Pounds of what, Judge? The tone expressed a heavy incredulity. Why? Pounds in money. Outside in the hall, with one ear held conveniently near the crack in the door, Deputy Sheriff Qualls gave a violent start, and then at once was torn between a desire to stay and hear more and an urge to hurry forth and spread the unbelievable tidings. After the briefest of struggles, the latter inclination won. This news was too marvellously good to keep. Surely a harbinger and a herald were needed to spread it broadcast. Mr. Qualls tiptoed rapidly down the hall. When he reached the sidewalk, the volunteer bearer of a miraculous tale fairly ran. As for the man who sat facing the judge, he merely stared in dull bewilderment. Judge, he said in length, I thousand pounds of money ought to make a powerful big pile, oughtn't it? It wouldn't weigh quite that much if you put it on the scales, explained his owner painstakingly. I mean pound sterling, English money. Near as I can figure offhand, it comes in a money to somewhere between thirty-five and forty thousand dollars. Nearer forty than thirty-five. And it's yours, Peep, every red cent of it. Excuse me, sir, and not meaning to contradict you or nothing like that, but I reckon there must be some mistake. Why, Judge, I don't scarcely know anybody that's as wealthy as all that, let alone anybody that would give me such a lot of money. Listen, Peep, this here letter I'm holding in my hand came to me by today's mail, just a little spell ago. It's from Ireland, from the town of Kilmore, where your people came from. It was sent to me by a firm of barristers in that town. Lawyers, we'd call them. In this letter, they asked me to find you and to tell you what's happened. It seems from what they write that your uncle, by name Daniel O'Day, died not very long ago without issue. That is to say, without leaving any children of his own and without making any will. It appears he had 8,000 pounds saved up. Ever since he died, those lawyers and some other folks over there in Ireland have been trying to find out who that money should go to. They learnt in some way that your father and mother settled in this town a mighty long time ago and that they died here and left one son, which is you. All the rest of the family over there in Ireland have already died out, it seems. That naturally makes you the next of kin and the heir at law, which means that all your uncle's money comes direct to you. So, Peep, you are a wealthy man in your own name. That's the news I had to tell you. Allow me to congratulate you on your good fortune. The beneficiary rose to his feet, seeming not to see the hand the old judge had extended across the desktop toward him. On his face, of a sudden, was a queer, eager look. It was as though he foresaw the coming true of long-cherished and heretofore unattainable visions. Have you got it here, sir? He glanced about him, as though expecting to see a bulky bundle. Judge Priest smiled. Oh, no, they didn't send it along with a letter. That wouldn't be regular. There's a quite a lot of things to be done first. There'll be some proofs to be got up, and so on too before a man called a British Council, and likely there'll be a lot of papers that you'll have to sign, and then all the papers and the proofs and things will be sent across the ocean, uh, and after some fees are paid out over there, why, then you'll get your inheritance. The rapt look faded from the strained face, leaving it downcast. I'm afraid then I won't be able to claim that they're money, he said forlornly. Why not? Because I don't know how to sign my own name. 
raised the way I was, I never got no book learning. I can't neither read nor write. Compassion shadowed the judge's chubby face, and compassion was in his voice as he made answer. You don't need to worry about that part of it. You can make your mark, just a cross mark on the paper with witness present, like this. They put up a pen, dipped it in the inkwell, and illustrated its meaning. Yes, sir. I'm glad it can be done that way. I always wished I knowed how to read big print and spell my own name out. I asked a fellow once to write my name out for me in plain letters on a piece of paper. I was aiming to learn to copy it off, but I showed it to one of the hands at the livery stable, and he busted out laughing. And then I come to find out this here fellow had tricked me for to make game of me. He hadn't wrote my name out at all. He had wrote some dirty words instead. So after that, I gave up trying to educate myself. That was several years back, and I ain't tried since. Now I reckon I'm too old to learn. I wonder, sir. I wonder if it'll be very long before that their money gets here, and I begin to have the spending of it. Making plans, sir, D. Yes, sir. Ori answered truthfully. I am. He was silent for a moment, his eyes on the floor. Then timidly, he advanced the thought that had come to him. I reckon, sir, it wouldn't be no more than fair and proper if I divided my money with you to pay you back for all this trouble. You're fixing to take on my account. Would uh, would half of it be enough? The other half ought to last me for what use I'll make of it. I know you mean well, and I'm much obliged to you for your offer, stated Judge Bray, smiling a little. But it wouldn't be fitting or proper for me to take a cent of your money. There'll be some court dues and some lawyer's fees and such to pay over there in Ireland. But after that's settled up, everything comes direct to you. It's going to be a pleasure to me to help you arrange these here details that you don't understand. A pleasure and not a burden, he considered the figure before him. Now, here's another thing, Peep. I judge it's hardly fitting for a man of substance to go on living the way you had had to live during your life. If you don't mind my offering you a little advice, I would suggest that you go right down to Felsbury Brothers when you leave here and get yourself fitted out with some suitable clothing. And you'd better go to Max Bideman's too and order a better pair of shoes for yourself than them you've got on. Tell them I sent you and that I guarantee the payment of your bills. Though I reckon that'll hardly be necessary. When the news of your good luck gets noised round, I missed out whether there's any firm in our entire city that wouldn't be glad to have you on their books for a steady customer. And also, if I was you, I'd arrange to get me regular board and lodging somewhere around town. You see, Peep, coming into a property entails considerable many responsibilities right from the start. Yes, sir, assented the legatee obediently. I'll do just as you say, Judge Priest, about the clothes and the shoes and all that. But, but, if you don't mind, I'd like to go on living at Gafford's. Pete Gafford's been mighty good to me, him and his wife both. And I wouldn't like for them to think I was getting stuck up just because I've had this here streak of luck coming to me. Maybe seeing as how things has changed with me, they'd be willing to take me in for a table boarder at their house. But I surely would hate to give up living in that there little room behind the feed room at the livery stable. I don't know as I could ever find any place that would seem as home-like to me as what it is. Suit yourself about that, said Judge Priest heartily. I don't know but what you've got the proper notion about it after all. Yes, sir. Them Gaffords have been pretty nigh the only real true friends I ever had that I could count on. He hesitated a moment. I reckon, I reckon, sir, it'll be a right smart while, won't it, before that money gets here from all the way across the ocean? Why, yes, I imagine it will. Was you figuring on investing a little of it now? Yes, sir, I was. About how much did you think of spending for your beginning? O'Day squinted his eyes, his lips moving in silent calculation. Well, sir, he said at length, I could use as much as a silver dollar. But of course, since... That sounds kind of moderate to me, broke in Judge Priest. He showed a pudgy hand into a pocket of his white trousers. I reckon this detail can be arranged. Here, Peep, he extended his hand. Here's your dollar. Then, as the other drew back, stammering a refusal, he hastily added, no, no, no. Go ahead and take it. It's yours. I'm just advancing it to you out of what will be coming to you shortly. I tell you what, until such time as you are in position to draw on your own funds, you just drop in here to see me when you are need of cash, and I'll try to let you have what you require, in reason. I'll keep a proper reckoning of what you get, and you can pay me back as soon as your inheritance is put into your hands. One thing more. He added as the hare, having thanked him, was making his grateful adieu at the threshold. 
Now that your wealthy are about to be so, I kind of imagine quite a parcel of fellows will suddenly discover themselves strangely and affectionately drawn towards you. You are liable to find out you have always had more true and devoted friends in this community than what you ever imagined to be the case before. Now, friendship is a mighty fine thing, taking it by and large, but it can be overdone. It's barely possible that some of this here new crop of your well-wishers and admirers will be making little business propositions to you, desiring to have you go partners with them in business, or to sell you desirable pieces of real estate, or even to let you loan them various sums of money. I wouldn't be surprised but what number of such chances will be coming your ways during the next few days and from then on. If such should be the case, I would suggest to you, before committing yourself to anybody or anything, you tell them that I am sort of acting as your unofficial advisor in money matters, and that they should come to me and outline their little schemes in person. Do you get my general drift? Yes, sir, said Pape. I won't forget. And thank you again, Judge, especially for letting me have this dollar ahead of time. He shambled out with a coin in his hand, and on his face was again the look of one who sees before him the immediate fulfillment of a delectable dream. With lines of sympathy and amusement cross-hatched at the outer corners of his eyelids, Judge Priest, rising and stepping to his door, watched the retreating figure of the town's newest and strangest capitalist disappear down the white front steps of the courthouse. Presently, he went back to his chair and sat down, tugging at his short chin beard. I wonder now, said he, meditatively addressing the emptiness of the room, I wonder what a man sixty-odd year old is going to do with the first whole dollar he ever had in his life. It was characteristic of a circuit judge that he should have voiced his curiosity aloud. Talking to himself when he was alone was one of his habits. Also, it was characteristic of him that he had refrained from betraying his inquisitiveness to his late caller. Similar motives of delicacy had kept him from following the other man to watch the sequence. However, at second hand, the details very shortly reached him. They were brought by no less a person than Deputy Sheriff Coles, who, some twenty minutes, or possibly half an hour later, obtruded himself upon Judge Priest's presence. Judge, began Mr. Qualls, you would never in the world guess what old people they had done with the first piece of money he got his hands on out of that there 40,000 pounds of silver dollars he has come into from his uncle's estate. The old man slanted a keen glance in Mr. Qualls' direction. Tell me, son, he asked softly, how did you come to hear the glad tidings so promptly? Me, said Mr. Qualls innocently. Why, Judge Priest, the word is all over this part of town by this time. Why, I reckon twenty-five or fifty people must have been watching old Peep to see how he was going to act when he comes out of his court house. Well, 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 murmured the judge blandly. Good news travels almost as fast as sometimes as what bad news does, don't it now? Well, son, I give up the riddle. Tell me just what our old friend did do with the first installment of his inheritance. Well, sir. He turned south here at the gate and bent down the street, a looking neither to the right nor the left. He looked to me like a man in a trance almost. He keeps right on through Legal Road till he comes to Franklin Street, and then he goes up Franklin to B. Whale and Sons Confectionery Store, and there he turns in. I happened to be following along behind him, with a few others, with several others in fact, and we all sort of slowed up in passing and looked in at the door. And that's how I come to be in a position to see what happened. Old Peep, he marches in just like I'm telling it to you, sir, and Mr. B. Weil comes to wait on him, and he starts in buying. He buys himself a five-cent bag of gumdrops, and a five-cent bag of jelly beans, and a ten-cent bag of mixed candies, kisses and candy motos and such as them, you know, and a sack of fresh roasted peanuts, a big sack it was fifteen-cent size, and two price boxes, and some ginger snaps, ten cents worth, and a coconut, and half a dozen red bananas, and half a dozen more of the plain yellow ones. Altogether, a figure is spent a even dollar. In fact, I see him hand Mr. Vale a dollar, and I didn't see him getting a no change back out of it. Then he comes on out of the store, with all these things stuck in his pockets, and stacked up in his arms till he looks sort of like some new kind of a summertime Santa Claus, and he sits down on a goods box at the edge of the pavement, with his feet in the gutter, and starts and eating all them things. First, he takes a bite of a yellow banana, and then of a red banana, and then a mouthful of peanuts, and then maybe some mixed candies, not saying a word to nobody, but just naturally eating his full head off. A young chap that's clerking in Baggy's grocery next door steps up to him and speaks to him meantime, I suppose, to ask him, is it true he's wealthy? An old peep, he says to him, please don't come bothering me now, sonny, I'm busy catching up, he says, and keeps right on munching and chewing like all possessed. But I ain't all of it neither judge. 
Not by a long shot it ain't. Pretty soon old Peep looks round him at the little crowd that's gathered. He didn't seem to pay no heed to the grown up people standing there, but he sees a couple of boys about ten years old in the crowd, and he beckons to them to come to him, and he makes room for them alongside him on the box and divides up his knickknacks with them. When he left there to come back on here, he had no less than six kids squatted round him, including one little nigger boy, and between them all they had just finished up the last of the bananas and peanuts and the candy and the ginger snaps, and was fixing to take turns drinking the milk out of the coconut. I suppose they've got it all cracked out of the shell and ate up by now, the coconut I mean. Judge, you ought to have stepped down into Franklin Street and taken a look at the picture whilst there was still time. You never seen such a funny sight in all your days, I'll bet. I reckon it'll be too late to be starting now, said Judge Priest. I'm right sorry I missed it. Busy catching up, hey? Yes, I reckon he is. Tell me, son, what did you make out of the way people reacted? Why, sir, stated Mr. Qualls, to my mind, Judge, I in no manner of doubt but what prosperity has went to his head and turned it. He acted to me like a plum, distracted idiot. A grown man with 40,000 pounds of solid money setting out on the side of the gutter and eating gym cracks with a parcel of dirty little boys. Can you figure it out any other way, Judge, except that his mind is gone? I don't set myself up to be a specialist in mental disorder, son, said Judge Priest softly. But since you ask me the question, I should say, speaking offhand, that it looks to me more as if the heart was the organ that was mainly affected. And possibly, he added this last with a dry little smite, and possibly by now, the stomach also. Whether or not Mr. Qualls was correct in his psychopathic diagnosis, he certainly had been right when he told Judge Priest that the word was LDD all over the business district. It had spread fast and was still spreading. It spread to beat the wireless, travelling as it did by that mouth-to-ear method of communication which is so amazingly swift and generally so tremendously incorrect. Persons who could not credit the tale at all nevertheless lost no time in giving to it a yet another circulation. So that, as though born on the wind, it moved on every direction, like ripples on a pond, and with each time of retelling, the size of the legacy grew. The daily evening news appearing on the streets at 5pm confirmed the tale. Though, by its account, the fortune was reduced to a sum of far below the gorgeously exaggerated estimates of most of the earlier narrators. Between breakfast and supper time, P. Poday's position in the common estimation of his fellow citizens underwent a radical and revolutionary change. He ceased, automatically as it were, to be a town character. He became, by universal consent, a town notable, whose every act and every word would thereafter be subjected to close scrutiny and closer analysis. The next morning, the nation at large had opportunity to know of the great good fortune that had befallen Paul Felix O'Day, for the story had been wired to the city papers by the local correspondents of the same, and the press associations had picked up a stickful of story and spread it broadcast over least wires. Many who until that day had never heard of the fortunate man, or indeed of the place where he lived, at once manifested a concern in his well-being. Certain firms of investment brokers in New York and Chicago promptly added a new name to what vulgarly they called the sucker list. Dealers in mining stocks, in oil stocks, in all kinds of attractive stocks showed interest. In circular form, samples of the most optimistic and alluring literature the world has ever known were consigned to the post, addressed to Mr. P. F. O'Day, such and such a town, such and such a state, care of general delivery. Various lonesome ladies in various lonesome places lost no time in sitting themselves down and inditing congratulatory letters. Object? Matrimony. Some of these were single ladies, others had been widowed, either by death or request. Various other persons of both sexes residing here, there and elsewhere in a country suddenly remembered that they too were descended from the old days of Ireland and wrote on forthwith to claim proud and fond relationship with a particular old day who had come into money. It was a remarkable circumstance which speedily developed that one man should have so many distant cousins scattered over the Union, and a thing equally noteworthy that particularly all these kinspeople, through no fault of their own, should at the present moment be in such strange circumstances and in such dire need of temporary assistance of a financial nature. Ticker and Printer Sync, operating in conjunction, certainly did their work mighty well. Even so, several days were to elapse before the news reached one who, of all those who read it, had most cause to feel a profound personal sensation in the intelligence. This delay, however, was nowise to be blamed upon the tardiness of the newspapers. 
It was occasioned by the fact that the person referred to was for the moment well out of contact with the active currents of world affairs being confined in a workhouse at Evansville, Indiana. As soon as he had rallied from the shock, this individual set about making plans to put himself in direct touch with the inheritor. He had ample time in which to frame and shape his campaign, inasmuch as there remained for him yet to serve nearly eight long and painfully tedious weeks of a three months vagrancy sentence. Unlike most of those now manifesting their interest, he did not write a letter, but he dreamed dreams that made him forget the annoyances of a ball and chain fast on his ankle and piles of stubborn stones to be cracked up into fine bits with a heavy hammer. We are getting ahead of a narrative there, days ahead of it. The chronological sequence of events properly dates from the morning following the morning when Peepo Day, having been abruptly translated from the masses of the penniless to the classes of the wealthy, had forthwith embarked upon the gastronomic orgy so graphically detailed by Deputy Sheriff Calls. On that next day, more eyes probably than had been trained in Peepo Day's direction in all the unremarked and unremarkable days of his life put together were focused upon him. Persons who theretofore had regarded his existence, if indeed they gave it a thought, as one of the utterly trivial and inconsequential instances of the cosmic scheme, were moved to speak to him, to clasp his hand, and in numerous instances to express a hearty satisfaction over his altered circumstances. To all these, whether they were moved by mere neighborly goodwill, or perchance were inspired by impulses of selfishness, the old man exhibited a mien of aloofness and embarrassment. This diffidence, or this suspicion, or this whatever it was, protected him from those who might entertain covetous and ulterior designs upon his inheritance, even better than though he had been brusque and rude, while those who sought to question him regarding his plans for the future drew from him while he mumbled and evasive replies which left him as deeply in the dark as they had been before. Altogether, in his intercourse with the adults, he appeared shy and very ill at ease. It was noted, though, that early in the forenoon he attached to him perhaps half a dozen urchins, of whom the oldest could scarcely have been more than twelve or thirteen years of age, and that these youngsters remained his companions throughout the day. Likewise, the events of that day were such as to confirm a majority of the observers in practically the same belief that had been voiced of Mr. Qualls, namely that whatever scanty brains people they might have ever had were now completely addled by the stroke of luck that had befallen him. In fairness to all, to O'Day and to the town critics who sat in judgment upon his behaviour, it should be stated that his conduct at the very outset was not entirely devoid of evidences of sanity. With his troop of ragged juveniles trailing behind him, he first visited Felsberg Brothers' emporium to exchange his old and disreputable costume for a wardrobe that, in accordance with Judge Priest's recommendation, he had ordered on the afternoon previous and which had since been undergoing certain necessary alterations. With his meagre frame encased in new black woolens and wearing as an incongruous added touch the most brilliant of neckties, a necktie of the shade of pomegranate blossom, he presently issued from Felsberg Brothers and entered Mr. Biderman's shoe store two doors below. Here Mr. Biderman fitted him with shoes and in addition noted down a further order which the purchaser did not give until after he had conferred earnestly with the members of his youthful entourage. Those watching the scene from a distance saw, and perhaps marvelled at the sight, that already between these small boys on the one part and this old man on the other, a perfect understanding appeared to have been established. After leaving by the man's and tagged by his small escorts, O'Day went straight to the courthouse, and upon knocking at the door was admitted to Judge Priest's private chambers, the boys meantime waiting outside in the hall. When he came forth, he showed them something he held in his hand and told them something whereupon all of them burst into excited and joyous whoops. It was at that point that O'Day, by the common verdict of most grown-up onlookers, began to betray the vagaries of disordered intellect. Not that his reason had not been under suspicion already, as a result of his freakish excess in the matter of B. Whale and Sun swears on the preceding day, but the relapse that now followed, as nearly everybody agreed, was even more pronounced, even more symptomatic than the early attack of aberration. In brief, this was what happened. To begin with, Mr. Virgil Overall, who dealt in lands and houses and sold insurance of all the commoner varieties on the side, had stalked O'Day to this point and was laying in wait for him as he came out of the courthouse into the public square, being anxious to describe to him some especially desirable bargains in both improved and unimproved reality. Also, Mr. Overall was prepared to book for him life, accident and health policies on the spot. 
So pleased was Mr. Overalls having distanced his professional rivals in the hunt that he dribbled at the mouth. But the warmth of his disappointment and indignation dried up his salivary fawns instantly when the prospective patron declined to listen to him at all and, breaking free from Mr. Overall's detaining clasp, hurried on into legal row with his small convoys trotting along ahead and alongside him. At the door of the Blue Goose Saloon and Short Order Restaurant, its proprietor by name Link is a man who is lurking, as it were, in ambush. He hailed the approaching Ode most cordially. He inquired in a warm voice regarding Ode's health, and then, with a rare burst of generosity, he invited, nay, urged Ode to step inside, have something on the house, wines, ales, liquors, or cigars. It was all one to Mr. Azerman. The other merely shook his head, and without a word of thanks for the offer, passed on as though bent upon an important mission. Mark how the proofs were accumulating. The man had disdained the company of men of approximately his own age or thereabout. He had refused the opportunity to partake of refreshment suitable to his years, and now he stepped into the bon ton toy store and bought for cash, most inconceivable of acquisitions, a little wagon that was painted bright red and bore on its sides in curlicued letters the name Comet. His next stop was made at Bishop and Bryan's Grocery, where, with the aid of his youthful compatriots, he first discriminately selected and then purchased on credit and finally loaded into the wagon such purchases as a dozen bottles of soda pop assorted flavors, cheese crackers, soda and animal, sponge cakes with weatherproof pink icing on them, fruits of the season, cove oysters, a bottle of pepper sauce and a quantity of the extra large sized bright green cucumber pickles known to the trade as a fancy jumbo brand prime selected. Presently, the astounded in spectacle was present of two small boys with string bridles on their arms, drawing the wagon through a town and out of it into the country, with Peepo Day in the role of teamster walking alongside the laden wagon. He was holding the lines in his hands and shouting orders at his team, who showed a quality inclination to shy at objects, to kick up their heels without provocation, and at intervals to try to run away. I a tense small voice, for by now the troop had grown in number and in volume of noise trailed along, keeping step with the elderly patron and advising him shrilly regarding the management of his refractory span. As it turned out, the destination of this preposterous procession was Bradshaw's Grove, where the entire party spent the day picnicking in the woods and, as reported by several reliable witnesses, playing games. It was not so strange that holidaying boys should play games. The amazing feature of the performance was that Peepo Day, a man old enough to be grandfather to any of them, played with them, being by turns an Indian chief, a robber baron, and the driver of a stagecoach attacked by wild western desperados. When he returned to town at dusk, drawing his little red wagon behind him, his new suit was rumpled into many wrinkles and marked by dust and grass stains. His flame-coloured tie was twisted under one ear, his new straw hat was mashed quite out of shape, and his eyes was a light that sundry citizens on meeting him could only interpret for a spark struck from inner fires of madness. Days that came after this, on through the midsummer, were with variations, but repetitions of the day I have just described. Each morning, Peepo Day would go to either the courthouse or Judge Priest's home to turn over to the judge the unopened mail which had been delivered to him at Gafford's tables. Then he would secure from the judge a loan of money against his inheritance. Generally, the amount of his daily borrowing was a dollar. Rarely was it so much as two dollars. And only once was it more than two dollars. By nightfall, the sun would have been expended upon perfectly useless and absolutely childish devices. It might be that he would buy toy pistols and paper caps for himself and his following of urchins. Or that his whim would lead him to expend all the money in tin flutes. In one case, the group he so incongruously headed would be for that one day a gang of make-believe banditti. In another, they would constitute themselves a fife and drum corps and barrel tops for the drums and would march through the streets where scandalized adults stood in their tracks to watch them go by, the all the while making weird sounds which with them passed for music. Or again, the available cash resources would be invested in provender and then there would be an outing in the woods. Under Peepo Day's captaincy, his chosen band of youngsters picked dewberries. They went swimming together in Guthrie's gravel pit out by the old fairgrounds, where his spare, naked shanks contrasted strongly with their plump, freckled legs as all of them splashed through the shallows 
making for deep water. Under his leadership, they stole watermelons from Mr. Dick Bell's patch, afterward eating their spoils in thickets of grape vines along the banks of Perkins Creek. It was felt that mental befuddlement and mortal folly could reach no greater heights or no lower depths than on a certain hour of a certain day along toward the end of August when Ode came forth from his quarters in Gafford stables wearing a pair of boots that Mr. Baderman's establishment had turned out to his order and his measure, not such boots as a sensible man might be expected to wear, but boots that were exaggerated and monstrous counterfeits of the red-topped, scroll-fronted, brass-toed, sub-heeled, squeaky-soled booties that small boys of an earlier generation possessed. Very proudly and seemingly unconscious of, or oblivious to the derisive remarks that the appearance of these new belongings drew from many persons, the owner went clumping about in them, with the rumply legs of his trousers tucked down in them, and ballooning up and out over the tops and folds which overlapped from his knee joints halfway down his attenuated calves. As Deputy Sheriff Qual said, the combination was a sight fit to make a horse laugh. It may be that small boys have a lesser sense of humour than horses have, for certainly the boys, who had the old man's invariable shadows, did not laugh at him, or at his boots either. Between the whiskered senior and his small comrades, there existed a freemasonry that made them all sense a thing beyond the ken of most of their elders. Perhaps this was because the elders, being blind in their superior wisdom, saw neither this thing nor the communion that flourished. They saw only the farcical joke. But his honour, Judge Priest, to cite a conspicuous exception, seemed not to see the lamentable comedy of it. Indeed, it seemed to some almost as if Judge Priest was aiding and abetting the befogged Ode in his demented enterprises, his peculiar excursions, and his weird purchases. If he did not actually encourage him in these constant exhibitions of witlessness, certainly there were no evidences available to show that he sought to dissuade Ode from his strange course. At the end of a fortnight, one citizen, in whom patience had ceased to be a virtue, and whose nature long continued silence on any public topic was intolerable, felt it his duty to speak to the judge upon the subject. This gentleman, his name was S. P. Escott, well, held with many that for the good name of the community, steps should be taken to obey the infantile, futile activities of the besotted legatee. Afterward, Mr. Escott, giving a partial account of the conversation with Judge Priest to certain of his friends, showed unfeigned annoyance at the outcome. I claim that old man's not fitting to be running a court any longer, he stated bitterly. He's too old and peevish. That's what ails him. For one, I'm certainly not ever going to vote for him again. Why, it's getting to be as much as a man's life is worth to stop that there spiteful old crank in the street and put a civil question to him. That's what's the matter. What happened, S.P.? inquired someone. Why, here's what happened, exclaimed the agreed Mr. Escott. I hadn't any more than started in to tell him the whole town was talking about the way that daffy old people day was carrying on, and that something had ought to be done about it, and didn't he think it was beholding on him a uh, circuit judge to do something right away, such as having O'Day tuck up and tried for a lunatic, and that I for one was ready and willing to testify to the crazy things I had seen done with my own eyes? When he cut in on me, and just as good as told me to my own face that if I had quit tending to other people's business, I'd maybe have more business of my own to tend to. Think of the gentleman, a circuit judge remaining a citizen and a taxpayer, checked himself slightly. Anyhow, a citizen that away. It shows that he can't be rational his own self. I personally claim old priest is falling mentally. He must be. And if anybody can be found to run against him at the next election, you gentlemen just watch and see who gets my wont. Having uttered this threat, with a deep and significant emphasis, Mr. Escort, still muttering, turned and entered the front gate of his boarding house. It was not exactly his boarding house. His wife ran it. But Mr. Escort lived there and voted from there. But the apogee of people day's carnival of weird vagaries of deportment came at the end of two months. Two months in which... Each day the man furnished cumulative and piled up material for derisive and jocular comment on the part of very considerable proportion of his fellow townsmen. Three occurrences of a widely dissimilar nature, yet all closely interrelated to the main issue, marked the climax of the man's new role in his new career. The first of these was the arrival of his legacy. The second was a one-ring circus, and the third and last was a nephew. In the form of sundry bills of exchange, the estate left by the late Daniel O'Day of the town of Kilmare 
in the island of Ireland was on a certain afternoon delivered over into Judge Priest's hands and by him in turn handed to the rightful owner after which sundry indebtedness representing the total of the old judge's day-to-day cash advances to O'Day were liquidated. The ceremony of deducting the sum took place at the planter's bank, whither the two had journeyed in company from the courthouse. Having, with the aid of the paying teller, instructed O'Day in the technical details requisite to the drawing of personal checks, Judge Priest went home and had his bag packed and left for Real Foot Lake to spend a week fishing. As a consequence, he missed the remaining two events following immediately thereafter. The circus was no great shakes of a circus. No grand, glittering, gorgeous, glorious pageant of education and entertainment travelling on its own special trains. No vast tented city of world's wonders and world's champions heralded for weeks and weeks in advance of its coming by dead walls, emblazoned with the finest examples of the lithographer's art and by half-page advertisements in the daily evening news. On the contrary, it was a shabby little wagon show which, coming overland on short notice, rolled into town under horsepower and set up its ragged and dusty canvases on the vacant lot across Easer's drug store. Compared with the street parade of any of its great and famous rivals, the street parade of the circus was a meagre and disappointing thing. Why, there was only one elephant, a dwarfish and debilitated looking creature, worn, mangy, and slick on its various angles like the cover of an old-fashioned hair-cloth trunk, and obviously most of the closed cages were weather-beaten stake wagons in disguise. Nevertheless, there was a sizable turnout of people for the afternoon performance. After all, a circus was a circus. Moreover, this particular circus was marked at the afternoon performance by happenings of a nature most decidedly unusual. At one o'clock, the doors were opened. At one ten, the eyes of the proprietor were made glad and his heart was uplifted within him by the sight of a strange procession drawing nearer and nearer across the scuffle turf of the common and heading in the direction of the red ticket wagon. At the head of the procession marched Peepo Day. Well, of course, the proprietor didn't know it was Peepo Day. A queer figure in his rumpled black clothes and his red top brass toed boots and with one hand holding fast to the string of a captive joy balloon. Behind him, in an uneven, jostling formation, followed many small boys and some small girls. A census of the ranks would have developed that hereby included practically all the juvenile white population who otherwise, through a lack of funds, would have been denied the opportunity to patronize the circus or, in fact, any circus. Each member of the joyous company was likewise the bearer of a toy balloon, red, yellow, blue, green, or purple, as the case might be. Over the line of heads, the taut, rubbery globes rode on their tethers, nodding and twisting like so many bright, iridescent bubbles. And half a block away, at the edge of the lot, a balloon vendor, whose entire stock had been disposed of in one splendid transaction, now stood empty-handed but full-pocketed, marvelling at the stroke of luck that enabled to take an afternoon off and rest his voice. Out of a seemingly bottomless exchequer, Peepo Day bought tickets of admission for all, but this was only the beginning. Once inside the tent, he procured accommodations in the reserved seat section for himself and those who accompanied him. From such superior points of vantage, the whole crew of them witnessed the performance, from the thrilling grand entry with spangled ladies and gentlemen riding two by two on broad back steeds, to the tumbling bout introducing the full strength of the company which came at the end. They munched fresh roasted peanuts and balls of sugar-coated popcorn, slightly rancid, until they munched no longer with zest but merely mechanically. They drank pink lemonade to an extent that threatened absolute depletion of the fluid contents of both barrels in the refreshment stand out in the menagerie tent. They whooped the unbridled approval when the wild Indian chief, after shooting down a stuffed coon with a bow and arrow from somewhere up near the top of the center pole while balancing himself jauntily erect upon the haunches of a coursing white charger, suddenly flung off his feathered headdress, his wig and his fringed leather garments, and revealed himself in pink fleshings as a principal bareback rider. They screamed in a chorus of delight when the funny old clown, who had been forcibly deprived of three tin flutes in rapid succession, now produced yet a fourth from the seemingly inexhaustible depths of his baggy white pants, a flute with a string and a bent pin attached to it, and secretly affixing the pin in the tail of the cross ringmaster's coat, was thereafter enabled to toot sharp, shrill blasts at frequent intervals, much to the chagrin of the ringmaster, 
who seemed utterly unable to discover the whereabouts of the instrument dangling behind him. But no one among them whooped louder or laughed longer than their elderly and bibiscuit friend who sat among them paying the bells. As his guest, they stayed for the concert, and following this, they patronized the sideshow in a body. They had been almost the first upon the scene. Assuredly, they were the last of the audience to quit it. Indeed, before they trailed their confier away from the spot, the sun was nearly done, and at scores of supper tables all over town, the tale of poor old P. Pori's latest exhibition of freakishness was being retailed with elaborations to interested auditors. Estimates of the sum probably expended by him in this crowning extravagance ranged well up into the hundreds of dollars. As for the object of these speculations, he was destined not to eat any supper at all that night. Something happened that so upset him as to make him forget the meal altogether. It began to happen when he reached the modest home of P. Gafford, adjoining the Gafford stables on Locust Street, and found sitting on the lowermost step of the porch a young man of untidy and unshaved aspect who hailed him affectionately as Uncle Paul and who showed deep annoyance and acute distress upon being rebuffed with chill words. It is possible that the strain of serving a three-month sentence on the technical charge of vagrancy in a workhouse somewhere in Indiana had affected the young man's nerves. His ankle bone still ached where the ball and chain had been hitched. On his palms, the blisters induced by the uncongenial use of a sledgehammer on a rock pile had hardly as yet turned to calluses. So it is only fair to presume that his nervous system felt the stress of his recent confining experiences also. Almost tearfully, he pleaded with Peepo Day to remember the ties of blood that bound them. Repeatedly, he pointed out he was the only known kinsman of the other in all the world and therefore had more reason than any other living being to expect kindness and generosity at his uncle's hands. He spoke socialistically of the advisability of an equal division. Failing to make any impression here, he mentioned the subject of a loan, at first hopefully, but finally despairingly. When he was done, Peep O'Day, in a perfectly colourless and unsympathetic voice, bade him goodbye. Not good night, but goodbye. And going inside the house, he closed the door behind him, leaving his newly returned relative outside and quite alone. At this, the young man uttered violent language, but since there was nobody present to hear him, it is likely he found small satisfaction in his profanity, rich though it may have been in metaphor and variety. So presently he betook himself off, going straight to the office and legal row of H.B. Sublet, attorney at law. From the circumstance that he found Mr. Sublet in, though it was long past that gentleman's office hours, and moreover found Mr. Sublet waiting in an expectant and attentive attitude, it might have been adduced by one skilled in the trick of putting two and two together that the pair of them had reached a prior understanding sometime during the day, and that the visit of the young man to the Gafford home and his speeches there had all been parts of a scheme planned out at a prior conference. Be this as it may, so soon as Mr. Sublet had heard his caller's version of the meeting upon the porch, he lost no time in taking certain legal steps. That very night, on behalf of his client, denominated in the documents as Percival Dwyer Esquire, he prepared a petition addressed to the circuit judge of the district, setting forth that, inasmuch as Paul Felix O'Day had by divers acts shown himself to be of unsound mind, now therefore came his nephew and next of kin praying that a committee or curator to be appointed to take over the estate of the said Paul Felix O'Day and administer the same in accordance with the orders of the court, until such time as they said Paul Felix O'Day should recover his reason, or should pass from this life, and so forth and so on. Not to mention whereas is in great number, and aforesets abounding throughout the text in the utmost profusion. On the following morning, the papers were filed with Circuit Clerk Milan. That vigilant barrister, Mr. Sublet, brought them in person to the quarters before nine o'clock, he having the interest of his client at heart, and perhaps also visions of a large contingent fee in his mind. No retainer had been paid. The state of Mr. Dwyer's finances, or rather the absence of any finances, had precluded the performance of that customary detail. But to Mr. Sublet's experienced mind, the prospects of future increments seemed large. Accordingly, he was all for prompt action. Formally, he said, he wished to go on record as demanding for his principal a speedy hearing of the issue with a view to preventing the defendant named in the pleadings from dissipating any more of the estate lately bequeathed to him and now fully in his possession, are words to that effect. Mr. Milan felt justified in getting into communication with Judge Priest over the long-distance phone, 
and the judge cutting short his vacation and leaving uncaught vast numbers of bays and perch in Reelfoot Lake came home arriving late that night. Next morning, having issued diverse orders in connection with the impending litigation, he sent a messenger to find P. O'Day and to direct O'Day to come to the courthouse for a personal interview. Shortly afterward, a scene that had occurred some two months earlier with his owner's private chamber for a sitting was substantially duplicated. There was the same cast of two, the same stage properties, the same atmosphere of untidy tidiness. And as before, the dialogues was in Judge Priest's hand. He led, and his fellow character followed his leads. Peep, he was saying. You understand, don't you, that this here fragrant nephew of yours, that's turned up from nowhere in particular, is fixing to get ready to try and prove that you are feeble-minded? And on top of that, that he's going to ask that a committee be appointed for you, in other words, that somebody or other shall be named by the court, meaning me, to take charge of your property and control the spending of it from now on? Yes, sir, stated O'Day. Pete Gafford, he sat down with me, and made it all clear to me yesterday evening, after they had done served the papers on me. All right, then. Now, I'm going to fix the hearing for tomorrow morning at ten. The other side is asking for a quick decision, and I rather figure they are entitled to it. Is that agreeable to you? What have you said, Judge? Well, have you retained a lawyer to represent your interest in the court? That's the main question that I sent for you to ask you. Do I need a lawyer, Judge? Well, there have been times when I regarded lawyers as being superfluous, said Judge Priest dryly. Still, in most cases, litigants do have them round when that case is being heard. I don't know as I need any lawyer to help me to say what I've got to say, said O'Day. Judge, you ain't never asked me no questions about the way I've been carrying on since I've come into this here money. But I reckon maybe this is as good a time as any to tell you just why I've been acting the way I've done. You see, sir? Hold on, broken Judge Priest. Up to now, as my friend, it would have been perfectly proper for you to give me your confidences if you were minded so to do. But now I reckon you'd better not. You see, I'm the judge that's got to decide whether you are a responsible person, whether you are mentally capable of handling your own financial affairs, or whether you aren't. So you'd better wait and make your statement on your own behalf to me whilst you're sitting on the bench. I'll see that you get an opportunity to do so, and I'll listen to it. I'll give it all the consideration it's deserving of. And on second thought, perhaps it will only be a waste of time and money for you to go hiring a lawyer especially to represent to you. Under the law, it's my duty, in such a case as this here one is, to appoint a member of the bar to serve during the proceedings as your guardian ad litem. You don't need to be startled, he added, as O'Day flinched at the sound in his ears of these strange and fearsome words. A guardian ad litem is simply a lawyer that tends to your affairs till the case is settled one way or the other. If you had a dozen lawyers, I'd have to appoint them just the same. So you don't need to worry about that part of it. That's all. You can go now if you want to. Wally, if I was you, I wouldn't draw out any more money from the bank fixed now and the time when I make my decision. All things considered, it was an unusual assemblage that Judge Priest regarded over the top rims of his glasses as he sat facing it in his broad armchair with the flat top of the bench intervening between him and the gathering. Not often, even in the case of exciting murder trials, had the old courtroom held a larger crowd. Certainly never had it held so many boys. Boys and boys exclusively filled the back rows of benches and downstairs. More boys packed the narrow shelf-like balcony that spanned the chamber across its far end. Mainly small boys, barefooted, sunburned, freckle-faced, shock-headed boys. And for boys, they were strangely silent and strangely attentive. The petitioner sat with his counsel, Mrs. Sublet. The petitioner had been newly shaved, and from some mysterious source had been equipped with a neat wardrobe. Plainly, he was endeavouring to wear a look of virtue, which was a difficult undertaking, as you would understand had he known the petitioner. The defending party to the action was seated across the room, touching elbows with old Colonel Farrell, dean of the local bar and its most florid orator. The court will designate Colonel Horatio Farrell as guardian ad litem for the defendant during these proceedings. Judge Priest had stated a few minutes earlier, using the formal and grammatical language he reserved exclusively for his courtroom. At once, old Colonel Farrell had hitched his chair up alongside O'Day, had asked him several questions in a tone inaudible to those about them, and listened to the whispered answers of O'Day and then had nodded his huge curly white dome of a head, as though amply satisfied with the responses. Let us skip the preliminaries. 
True, they seem to interest the audience. Here, though, they would be tedious reading. Likewise, in touching upon the opening and outlining address of attorney at law sublet letters, for the sake of time and space, be very much briefer than Mrs. Sublet was. For our present purposes, I deem it sufficient to say that in all his professional career, Mr. Sublet was never more eloquent, never more forceful, never more vehement in his allegations, and never more convinced, as he himself stated, not once but repeatedly, of his ability to prove the facts he alleged by competent and unbiased testimony. These facts, he pointed out, were common knowledge in the community. Nevertheless, he stood prepared to buttress them with the evidence of reputable witnesses given under oath. Mr. Sublet, having unwound at length, now wound up. He sat down, perspiring freely, and through the perspiration, radiating confidence in his contentions, confidence in the result, and most of all, unbounded confidence in Mr. Sublet. Now Colonel Farrell was standing up to address the court. Under the cloak of a theatrical presence in a large, oratant manner, and behind a Ciceronian command of sonorous language, the colonel carried concealed a shrewd old brain. It was as though a skilled marksman lurked in ambush amid a tangle of luxuriant foliage. In this particular instance, moreover, it is barely possible that the colonel was acting on a cue, privily conveyed to him before the court opened. May it please your honour, he began, I have just conferred with the definant here, and acting in the capacity of his guardian ad litem, I have advised him to waive an opening address by counsel. Indeed, the definant has no counsel. Furthermore, the definant also acting upon my advice, will present no witness in his own behalf. But with your honour's permission, the defendant will now make a personal statement, and thereafter he will rest content, leaving the final arbitrament of the issue to your honour's discretion. I object, exclaimed Mr. Sublet briskly. On what ground does the learner's counsel object? inquired Judge Priest. On the grounds that, since the mental competence of this man is concerned, since it is a contention that he is patently and plainly a victim of senility, an individual prematurely in his dotage, any utterance by him will be of no value whatsoever in aiding the conscience and intelligence of the court to arrive at a fair and just conclusion regarding the defendant's mental condition. Mr. Sublet excelled in use of big words. There was no doubt about that. The objection is overruled, said Judge Priest. He nodded in the direction of O'Day and Colonel Farrell. The court will hear the defendant. He is not to be interrupted while making a statement. The defendant may proceed. Without further urging, Ore stood up, a tall, slap-sided rack of a man, with his long arms dangling at his sides, half facing Judge Priest and half facing his nephew and his nephew's lawyer. Without hesitation, he began to speak. And this was what he said. There's maybe some here as knows about how I was raised and fetched up. My pa and my ma died when I was just only a baby. So I was brung up out here at the old county poorhouse as a pauper. I can't remember the time when I didn't have to work for my board and keep and work hard. While other boys was going to school and playing hooky and going and washing in the creek and playing games and all such as that, I had to work. I had never done no playing round in my whole life, not till here just recently anyway. But I always craved to play round some. I didn't never say nothing about it to nobody after I growed up, cause I figured it out they wouldn't understand and maybe I'd laugh at me. But all these years, Ever since I left that there poor house, I've had a hankering here inside of me. He lifted one hand and touched his breast. I've had a hankering to be a boy and to do all the things a boy does, to do things I was chiseled out of doing whilst I was of suitable age to be doing them. I call to mind that I used to dream and may sleep about doing them, but the dream never come true. Not till just here lately. It didn't have no chance to come true. Not till then. So when this money come to me so sudden, and unbeknownst like, I said to myself that I was going to make that their dream come true, and I started out for to do it, and I'd done it, and I reckon that's the cause of my being here today, accused of being feeble-minded. But even so, I don't regret it none. If it was all to do over again, I'd do it just the very same way. Why, I never knowed what it was, till here two months or so ago, to have my fill of bananas and candy and ginger snaps, and all such knick-knacks is them. All my life I've been craving secretly to own a pair of red top boots with brass toes on them, like I used to see other boys wearing in the winter time when I was out yonder at the poor house wearing an old pair of somebody else's cast off shoes. Maybe a man's shoes with rags wrapped around my feet to keep the snow from coming through the cracks in them and to keep them from slipping right spang of my feet. 
I got three toes frostbit once during a cold spell wearing them kind of shoes. But here the other week I found myself able to buy me some red top boots with brass toes on them. So I had them made to order and I'm wearing them now. I wear them regular even if it is summer time. I take a heap of pleasure out of them. And also all my long life I've been wanting to go to a circus. But not till three days ago I didn't ever get a chance to go to one. That gentleman yonder, Mr. Sublet, he allowed now that I was leading a lot of little boys in this here town into bad habits. He said that I was learning them nobody knowed what devilment. And he spoke of my having egged them on to steal watermelons from Mr. Bell's watermelon patch out here there three miles from town on the Marshallville gravel road. You all heard what he just now said about that. I don't mean no offence, and I beg this pardon for contradicting him right out before everybody here in the big court. But, mister, you're wrong. I don't lead these boys astray that I've been running round with. They are mighty nice, clean boys, all of them. Some of them are mighty near as poor as what I used to be. But there ain't I no real harm in any of them. We get along fine, me and them. And without no preaching, no, nothing like that. I've done my best these weeks. We've been frolicking and projecting round together to keep them from growing up to do mean things. I use chewing tobacco myself, but I've told them I don't know how many times that if they chew, it'll stun them in their growth. And I've got several of them that were smoking cigarettes on the slide to promise me they'd quit. So I don't figure as I've done them boys any real harm by going wrong with them. And I believe if you was to ask them, they'd all tell you the same, sir. Now, about them watermelons. Since this gentleman has brung them watermelons up, I'm going to tell you all the truth about that too. He cast a quick, furtive look, almost a guilty look over his shoulder toward the rear of the courtroom before he went on. Them watermelons wasn't really stolen at all. I seen Mr. Dick Bell beforehand and arranged with him to pay him in full for whatever damage might be done. But you see, I know watermelons tasted sweeter to a boy if he thought he'd hooked him out of a patch. So I never let on to my little partners yonder that I'd the same as paid Mr. Bell in advance for the melons we snuck out of the patch and ate in his woods. They'll all been thinking up till now that we really hooked them watermelons. But if that was wrong, I'm sorry for that. Mr. Sublet, you just now said I was frittering away my property on vain foolishment. Them was the words you used, frittering and vain foolishment. Maybe you're right, sir, about frittering part. But if spending money in a certain way gives a man as much pleasure as it gives me these last two months, and if the money is his by rights, I figure it can't be so very foolish, though it may appear to some. Excusing these here clothes I've got on, and these here boots, which I ain't paid for yet, but is charged up to me on Felsberg Brothers' books and Mr. M. Biderman's books, I didn't spend only a dollar a day, or maybe two dollars. And once three dollars in a single day out of water is coming to me, the judge here, he let me have that out of his own pocket, and I paid him back. And that was all I did spend till yet three days ago when that there circus come to town. I reckon I did spend a right smart then. My money had come from the old country, only the day before. So I went to the bank, and they write out one of them pieces of paper which is called a check, and I signed it with my mark, and they give me the money I wanted, and even two hundred dollars. And part of that their money I used to pay for circus tickets for all the little boys and little girls I could find in this town that couldn't have got to circus no other way. Some of them are sitting back there behind you all now. Some of the boys I mean. I don't see none of the little girls. There were several of them told me at the time they hadn't never seen a circus, not in their whole lives. For that matter, I hadn't neither. But I didn't want no poor child in this town to grow up to be as old as I am without having been to at least one circus. So I'd taken them all in and paid all the bills. And when night come, there wasn't but about nine dollars left out of the whole two hundred that I'd started out with in the morning. But I don't begrudge spending it. It looked to me like it was money well invested. They all seemed to enjoy it. And I know I'd done so. There may be bigger circuses with that one was. But I don't see how a circus could have been any better than this here one I'm telling about if it was ten times as big. I don't regret the investment, and I don't aim to lie about it now. Mr. Sublet, I do the same thing over again if the chance should come, lawsuit or no lawsuit. If you should win this here case, maybe I wouldn't have no second chance. If some gentleman is appointed as committee to handle my money, it's likely he wouldn't look at the things the same way I do. 
It's likely he wouldn't let me have so much money all in one lump to spend taking a parcel of little shavers that I know kin to me to the circus and to the side show, besides letting them stay for the grand concert or after show and all. But I done it once, and I've got it to remember about and think about it in my own mind as long as I live. I'm about finished now. There's just one thing more I'd like to say, and that is this. Mr. Sublet, he said a minute ago that I was in my second childhood, meaning no offence, sir, but you was wrong there too. The way I look at it, a man can't be in a second childhood without he's had his first childhood, and I was cheated plumb out of mine. I'm more than sixty years old, as near as I can figure, but I'm trying to be a boy before it's too late. He paused a moment and looked round him. The way I look at it, Judge Priest, sir, and you all, every man that grows up, no matter how old he may get to be, is entitled to have been a boy once in his lifetime. I, I reckon that's all. He sat down and dropped his eyes upon the floor, as though ashamed that his temerity should have carried him so far. There was a strange little hush filling the courtroom. It was Judge Priest who broke it. The court, he said, has, by the words just spoken by this man, been sufficiently advised as to the sanity of the man himself. The court cares to hear nothing more from either side on the subject. The petition is dismissed. Very probably these last words may have been so much Greek to the juvenile members of the audience. Possibly, though, they were made aware of the meaning of them by the look upon the face of the nephew Percival Dwyer and the look upon the face of the nephew Percival Dwyer's attorney. At any rate, his honour hardly had uttered the last syllable of his decision before, from the rear of the courtroom and from the gallery above, there arose a shrill, vehement, sincere sound of yelling, exultant, triumphant and deafening. It continued for upward a minute before the small disturbers remembered where they were and reduced themselves to a state of comparative quiet. For reasons best known to himself, Judge Priest, who ordinarily stickled for order and decorum in his courtroom, made no effort to quell the outburst or to have it quelled not even when a considerable number of the adults present joined in it, having first cleared their throats of a slight huskiness that had come upon them, severally and generally. Presently the judge rapped for quiet, and got it. It was apparent that he had more to say, and all there hearkened to hear what it might be. I've just this to add, quoth his honour. It is the official judgment of this court that the late defendant, being entirely sane, is competent to manage his own affairs after his preferences. And it is the private opinion of this court that not only is the late defendant sane, but that he is the sanest man in his entire jurisdiction. Mr. Clark, this court stands adjourned. Coming down the three short steps from the raised platform of the bench, Judge Priest beckoned to Sheriff Giles Birdsong, who, at the tail of the departing crowd, was shepherding its last exuberant members through the doorway. Giles, said Judge Priest in an undertone, when the worthy sheriff had drawn near. The circuit clerk tells me there's an indictment for malicious mischief against this year pursed by a knocking round amongst the records somewhere. An indictment the grand jury returned several sessions back, but which was never passed owing to the sudden departure from our midst of the person in question. I wonder if it would be too much trouble for you to sort of drop a hint in the ear of the young man or his lawyer that the said indictment is apt to be revived, and that the said Dwyer is liable to be tucked into custody by you and lodged in a county jail sometime during the ensuing forty-eight hours, without he should see his way clear during the meantime to get clean out of the city, county and state? Would it? Trouble? No, sir. It won't be no trouble to me, said Mr. Birdsong promptly. Why, it'll be more of a pleasure, judge? And so it was. Except for one small added and purely incidental circumstance, our narrative is ended. The same afternoon, Judge Priest sat on the front porch of his old White House out on Clay Street, waiting for Jeff Poindexter to summon him to supper. Peepo Day opened the front gate and came up the gravelled walk between the twin rows of silver leaf poplars. The judge, rising to greet his visitor, met him at the top step. Come in, bade the judge heartily, and sat on a spell and rest your face and hands. No, sir, much obliged. But I ain't got only a minute to stay, said Dore. I just came out here, sir, to thank you for what you've done today, on my account in the big courthouse, and and to make you a little kind of a present. It's all right to thank me, said Judge Priest, but I couldn't accept any reward for entering a decision in accordance with the plain facts. Time no gift of money or nothing like that, 
Ode hastened to explain. Really, sir, it don't amount to nothing at all scarcely. But a little while ago I happened to be in Mr. B. Whale and Son's store, doing a little trading, and I ran across a new kind of knick-knack, which it seemed like to me it was about the best thing I ever tasted in my whole life. So on my chance it, sir, that you might have a sweet tooth too, I took the liberty of bringing you a sack of them. And, and, and here they are, sir. Three flavors, strawberry, lemon, and vanilla. Suddenly, overcome with confusion, he dislodged a large-sized paper bag from his side coat pocket and thrust it into Judge Priest's hands. Then, backing away, he turned and clumped down the gravel path in great and embarrassed haste. Judge Priest opened the bag and peered down into it. It contained a sticky, sugary dozen of flattened confections, each molded round a short length of wooden splinter. These syrupy articles, which have since come into quite gentle use, are known, I believe, as all day suckers. When Judge Priest looked up again, Peep O'Day was outside the gate, plumping down the uneven sidewalk of Clay Street with long strides of his booted legs. Half a dozen small boys, who it was evident, had remained hidden during the ceremony of presentation, now mysteriously appeared and were accompanying the departing donor, half trotting to keep up with him.